You're listening to Heart of Mind, Radio for the New Millennium. I'm Katherine Davis, and today we're going to be talking about the WE campaign at WE.net. The objective of the organization, WE the World, is to facilitate cooperation on a global scale amongst groups and individuals dedicated to implementing solutions to the many challenges we face on the planet at this time. And you, the listeners, are invited to join in this movement, without which all other movements for change cannot be successful. The crucial movement we are talking about is the shift from I to we. We have the three eyes to become a we, inspire, inform, involve. To learn more and to join this wonderful group of people, you can visit www.we.net. And we'll give information again as we go forward, how you can get in touch. And I'm really happy today to be, te- to be speaking with two of these wonderful people who have been contributing their time and energy and creativity to this project. Joining us today is Ugoji Eze. She is an attorney, author, entrepreneur, and a skilled producer of events and programs at the United Nations in New York. A former child refugee, she has written on the current ongoing refugee crisis from the perspective of U.S. national security, reaffirming U.S. commitment to refugees, a challenge to security and engagement. She has also written about autism in Africa, the need for life-saving awareness. She is a conveyor and advocate and a global leader, a tireless advocate for women, children, and youth in conflicts and war zones. Her work has been recognized in combating anti-Semitism and related intolerance and global peace, including being designated Ambassador for Peace from the Universal Peace Federation and has received a proclamation honoring her from the city of Houston, Texas. So welcome. Gozi, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. And Mm -hmm. hello to... Yes. And also joining me is Sharon Rea, and she is a passionate woman on a serious mission to make the world a better place. She is founder of the global movement, No Judgment, Just Love. People around the world are embracing this message and inspiring others to live together with unconditional allowance, one conversation at a time. Living the NJJL way means you are willing to choose to move beyond judgments that divide to consciously lead with love in your thoughts, words, and actions. This will genuinely help us relate to each other better. Sharon is also a certified family communication and relationship coach, owner of The Whole Family Coaching. She compassionately helps families find solutions to challenges raising teens, co-parenting after divorce for grandparents, raising grandchildren, fathers, taking on new roles in parenting, and every caregiver focused on raising responsible, self-confident, and happy children. And you can find her work at njjl.world and Sharon at njjl.world. So thank you both. I'm so happy to have this conversation. And we have been in conversation about the 11 days of global unity um, leading up into this current period, which starts September 11th to the 21st. And I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about the work that you're doing as part of this movement, but also anything you want to include 
about your personal work in terms of what you're doing every day in the world. And I think that's equally as important. So who, I, why don't we start with, um, hmm, who would like to speak first? Ugoji? I'd like to hear from Ugoji. I love Ugoji? what she has to say. Oh. Okay. Well, thank, you. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me and hello to Sharon. Um, the 11 days I'm um, leaving up to the 21st of, um, of September, which is actually the UN Day of Peace. Um, for this um, day, the 11th day, I'll actually be hosting two events. Um, the 16th, I'll be hosting one on the eternally displaced children, the missing gap in the global humanitarian crisis. And on the 18th, I'll be part of a workshop, um, Voices of Refugees Up Close and Personal. Now, as you can see, both um, events are very personal to me. Um, I'm an international humanitarian um, a lawyer, and I'm also a former Biafran refugee. And um, at the UN, I'm an NGO, and I advocate for women and children in conflict zones, and I also focus on the refugee crisis. Now, the reason I decided to focus this year on internally displaced children, um, the missing gap in the global humanitarian crisis, is that globally they're estimated about 20 million children are displaced by armed conflict or human rights violation. Now, these children are forced to flee their homes and they become victims of violence, sexual exploitation, forced recruitment, malnutrition, death, human trafficking, and violence. Now, I believe these internally displaced children are the missing gaps in the global humanitarian crisis, and they urgently need our assistance and protection. Now, we all know about refugees. Refugees are those who cross borders, international borders, and seek refuge, like myself during the Nigerian Biafra crisis over 50 years ago. Uh, but internally displaced children, they remain within, remain under the protection of their own government. They do not cross borders and thus they retain all their fundamental human rights and indeed protection under both human rights and international humanitarian law. Now, we're all aware of the um, millions of ch children, 2.5 to be quite exact, who have been displaced um, within Syria um, on the ongoing um, Syrian crisis. But we need to take um, a moment and pause and think about um, the, num the enormous amount of children who have been displaced um, within the African borders. They are internally displaced children in Africa. The media seems to have focused tremendously on the Syrian crisis, the displaced children within Syria, and those who've been fortunate to cross international borders and become refugees. But we need to think about the internally displaced children in Africa. Now, this event will bring together representatives of governments, UN agencies, and development and humanitarian partners, and will encourage exchange of views, will share experiences, and will set common goals and targets in line with the 2030 United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development, particularly the goals related to children, health, poverty, education, partnerships, and above all, um, Agenda um, 16, which speaks in terms of peaceful and just societies. Now, we all know that in terms of conflict zones, they are not peaceful and just societies. We will highlight the challenges that internally displaced children face. We'll articulate possible solutions to the effects of conflicts on vulnerable displaced children. And we'll reflect on how to ensure that the plight of internally displaced children are put on the international agenda. Um, the guiding questions which we'll ask at this event is how can we develop and implement policies and programs to protect these children who are forced to flee due to climate change, conflicts, wars, terrorism, and indeed national policies? And what can the international community do to support NGOs like myself 
in terms of capacity building to develop, develop and implement programs to reach the internally displaced children? And how can we capitalize on our efforts to build back better from the impact of the COVID-19, which is having a tremendous impact on the internally displaced situations and mostly children, and to strengthen our resilience to climate change, the pandemic and related disasters. So I hope that um, you'll join me to raise awareness, um, increase commitment and deepen dialogue among the global community, representatives of affected countries, more particularly Africa, as well as stakeholders on mainstreaming internally displaced children into the national and international discourse, and above all, to synthesize views expressed by us and our key messages as possible policy recommendations for mitigating the plight of internally displaced children. Um, it is expected that the event will compromise of two segments, will have the keynote address, an interact, interactive dialogue, sharing of perspective and brief comments by the participants and also the response from the participants and people watching online. Um, also be hosting on the 18th, uh, the Voices of Refugees Up Close and Personal, um, in collaboration with um, Jackie Park, um, Parker. We'll be discussing the plight of refugees. And again, this will be very personal to me because, as I say, I was a refugee in the 1966 nigeria Biafra conflict. And I know only too well what it is to be a refugee. When, our, when my rights were taken away, when I did not go to school for two years, and when as a child you find it extremely difficult when you're on the move, when you're traveling, and as we did in our case, from country to country, and most countries, nations said the plane could land, but they will not accept us and we could not apply for asylum as they did not recognize Biafra. It has left a tremendous um, impact on me and it has driven me in the sense that I've been committed to be the voice for the voiceless and also to give voices to refugees to express how they feel and what they expect um, from society and also to break down this stereotype in this xenophobia of refugees. Now I was a refugee over 50 years ago and I must admit that the situation is completely different from it is now with the ongoing Syrian crisis and the ongoing refugee crisis from um, Afghanistan and different parts of the world. Because in today's context, these refugees have to contend with the issue of Islamophobia. A majority of them are Muslims. So there's this breaking down of communication. There's this hatred of refugees. Um, in a similar vein, I've um, established an initiative, Sticks and Stones Refugee Educational Initiative, which um, the mission is to promote excellence in refugee education and empowerment. And the vision is to encourage refugee children to strive for excellence and fulfill their potential, and to encourage lifelong learning skills through music, arts, and sports, and also achieving their full potential through creative writing. Hmm. Well, that's certainly a, a big, big body of work, <laughs> I have to say. Um, it seems so overwhelming to have, um, to really look at that. But, you know, it's wonderful to see that you are sort of leading the way here and getting people involved in terms of knowing that it's even a problem, but secondly, um, suggesting what they can do about it. And a big part of that, it seems, is opening people's minds to the awareness mm. of what's going on. But mm. I'm wondering, when you're talking about children that are still in their, their countries and are displaced, mm. is, what is available to them now? Is there anything or are they just basically children living on the streets of the cities or townships? How, how are they surviving? Well, take for example, if we were to take the, the US situation, 
internally displaced children are more fortunate than, say, for example, if you were to take it in the context of Africa or other developing nations. They do have the facilities of the social services. But if you're an internally displaced child, we have to look at their, them from the perspective of their education. You know, education is, is very powerful. Education is something that we take for granted. Now, when you're internally displaced, or even if you're a refugee, most people think that education is something that is there for the taking. But as I say for myself, as a refugee, um, when I, I started off being internally displaced within Biafra, I didn't go to school for two years because of the fear of um, our schools being bombed, which, it, which I had in, then in, in during the Biafran conflict. So I believe that education is very important and something that we should not really take for granted. So even if a child is internally displaced here within the United States, you have to think in terms of the education. How is the right to education being fulfilled? Are they getting the correct education or are they constantly being on the move? Are they moving from one shelter to another shelter? Are they moving from one agency to another agency? So from the point of view of education, it's very important. And also another important issue is the psychological impact of conflicts on a child. The psychological impacts, for example, if you're in a war zone or a conflict zone, what is the psychological impact of conflict, war, being internally displaced on a child. It is tremendous. I remember going through it when I was six, seven years old. I didn't know from one day to the next where we'll be, whether we'll leave the country. Um, psychology, um, psychological impact is an aspect which all those years ago was never really taken into consideration. I was never asked, how do you feel? I was fortunate enough, we, Portugal granted us asylum. I lived in Portugal, Lisbon for a year, but nobody took care of my psychological impact. You know, you've just come from a war zone. I'd witnessed the constant bombings. You, we couldn't sleep at the night. I remember one, one Christmas day, we had to have gas masks on and go into an um, air raid shelter. Nobody actually asked me, asked me, Gorgi, you know, how do you feel? How are you feeling? And when we eventually settled in, in London, and I always remember that grey day in September 1967, arriving in London, um, the British government did not recognise Biafra at that time, I must say, so we really weren't welcomed. I remember arriving one week and two weeks later, you know, I was sitting in a classroom and nobody said to me, you know, how do you feel? How are you feeling? They expected you just to basically, you know, the traditional um, British attitude, you have a step up a lip and just get on with things. Nobody said to me, you know, how are you really feeling? Nobody sort of noticed that I was left behind. I'd not gone to school for two years. I couldn't write properly. And even to today, I can't really write properly. So thank God for iPads and um, computers. So, you know, nobody has to look at my writing. But nobody sort of says to you, you know, how are you really feeling? You know, and nobody really sort of looked at it in the terms of the complex of um, the family unit. Um, as a direct result of the Biafran conflict, a lot of families were broken because a lot of um, Nigerian fathers or Biafran fathers were left behind in Nigeria and as a product of a mixed marriage so my mother could take the children out. Nobody really sort of talk about the psychological impact of the family. You know, how can a family come through war and still be a, uh, a unit, a united unit? You know, it, it, it's not really possible. You know, it's, it's basically not really possible. So my heart goes out now for the internally displaced children within borders globally. Um, but I, I believe that more emphasis should be on the psychological impact of the movement within their borders and also their education. Mm -hmm. you know, 
the the education that says it, there's a there's a saying that it takes a village to raise a child i believe that the village should be the international community and we should focus on the education and the psychological impact of the movement of children within borders very good and um how were you able to survive to become the woman you are today <laughs> I think it's um, first and foremost, I give thanks to God and um, to God be the glory. And also I've always been, I've always been very determined. I can always remember as a 10 year old child um, when I was in school in England and my headmaster called me to his study and broke to me the sad news that um, the, the Biafra had lost the war. And I always remember feeling so sad, um, so disappointed, so bitter. And I believe that day I made up my mind that I was going to be somebody. I remember telling the headmaster that mm -hmm. I will show them. And he looked at me because he said to me, and he said to my mother, does she understand what we're trying to tell her? And I said to him that one day um, I'll be a lawyer and I'll put things right. You know, mm. and I'll be a voice um, or give voice to the voiceless to children because um, I took it personally, I'll be quite honest with you, because I'd felt as if my whole childhood had been um, impacted by war and by conflict. And to suddenly realize that it was all over. And, but then to suddenly. I thought about the other children who had left behind. And also I thought about our journey um, from then Biafra to, to San Tome, to Portugal, and finally to London. And I remember feeling that, you know, this, you know, this wasn't right, that, you know, to, put, mm -hmm. to have to put children through this just was not right. And at that time, children did not have their voice and, um, most international organizations, um, even the UN itself, did not recognize Biafra. And um, I remember feeling that this just was not right, you know, to have to put children through this, mm -hmm. that, you know, there had to be a better way to deal with this. There had to be a solution so that um, no other child would have to go through what I went through and some other children in war zones. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And we're going to remind people of your events before we finish up, but I wanted to give uh, Sharon Rea a chance to talk to us about no judgment, just love, because the work that you're doing really gives us pathways towards healing. And that's important, yeah. no matter what the experience is. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Catherine. And Ugoji, I honor the work that you're doing. It is very complimentary and necessary to what I'm offering to the world as well. <clears throat> In the space of the 11 days of global unity, the first campaign is unity. And that is where No Judgment, Just Love is falling this year. We mm -hmm. are beginning a five day, <clears throat> excuse me, No Judgment, Just Love challenge. And it begins on September 17th, which is a Thursday. And it ends, as you quite nicely noted, uh, Ugoji, on UN uh, Peace Day, which I have experienced as International Peace mm. Day. And mm. so with No Judgment, Just Love, I just want to share a little bit about the compliment that it gives to Ugoji's mission, as well as our own personal journey towards unity. The first thing is that I believe words matter. And when we can get a definition that we can uh, don't have to agree on, but allow to sink in and, and resonate with you. And unity is a challenging word because I think many people assume unity means we have to be the same. And mm -hmm. that is not, not possible <laughs> because <laughs> we are not the same. And it also might mean that we have to be uniform in our behavior, in our response to things, in our 
actions as humans on this planet. And, and that's not really possible either because we are different. So to me, I want to open up the space for unity to be um, unified under a myriad of different foundations. The first being we all are here and we all matter. And if we can come from that foundational place, then I think we have opportunity to see our diversity, to see our different nations, and to see our opportunity to be in unity with each other. Now, No Judgment, Just Love responds to Ugoji's comment about how children are brought up, their surroundings. Of course, we judge all the time. This is not a mission that asks you to do something inconsistent with being human. We judge, we should, we have to, sometimes evaluating and discerning what is your surroundings, who you are, who you are interacting with is helpful and necessary. So my ask with no judgment, just love is to once you judge and you will take a pause and come from that foundational place that we all matter and see if you can uncover for yourself personally something different, something that either puts it in a positive light, what you have just judged, or puts it in a neutral light, allowing you to have and discover different ways to respond or not. And thereby, I think when we can take the judgments that we make and move beyond them to really, really lead with an allowance that everyone has a right to be here. And that right includes respecting whomever they are. You don't have to interact with people that might want to cause you harm. You don't have to interact with people that you uh, have a, a very big disagreement with. But in your heart, in your ability to be in unity with everyone, you recognize that everyone has not only a journey that they're taking and they're different every day and they're growing, they may not look like you, they may not act like you, but they deserve respect and allowance. And so my goal with these 11 days and this five day challenge is to create an international opportunity for each person if they choose to look within because we cannot, I believe, come to the soup of humanity <laughs> without being the best ingredient we can be individually. Mm -hmm. And so I'm asking for those five days to explore for yourself how you can have less judgment and more loving allowance for five different areas. Yourself, first, a family member, international community creating a friendship, those that you disagree with and those that would benefit from your forgiveness. Wow. That's pretty special and amazing. And um, if, if only people would do it, the world needs it desperately. Can you go into some of those ideas to suggest to people how they might approach this? Because yeah. on the surface, it feels a little bit opaque. Well, how do I, forgive my enemy you know or yes. how do i um have no judgment of something that looks really really bad exactly thank you for that opportunity it begins with yourself because we cannot give what we don't have and so the first place to begin is why the first challenge is uh figuring out how to judge yourself less i'm not in everyone's head but i am in mine <laughs> And I have a lot of judgments about my age, about my weight, about my uh, confidence, about my success or not. And when I can give myself a loving allowance that I am practicing this human experience, <laughs> I didn't come here knowing exactly what to do every day, but I can mm -hmm. start with, I matter. Mm. And I am the one that needs to be my biggest cheerleader, not my biggest judgment person. And so when I judge that this body is a couple of decades older than it was a couple of decades before, <laughs> <laughs> and 
it's doing some things that I don't understand. <laughs> On that day of the five day challenge, pick one thing that you can choose to judge yourself less about, whether it's mm -hmm. your career, whether it's your weight, whether it's anything about yourself. And then once you have that opportunity to have gone through, okay, I don't like where it is, but I can love that I'm still here. Whatever the words are that you come to, now next you can go to your family member, which I believe is the next set of people that you have the most interaction with, with personally, that judgments creep up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now that you've given yourself that journey, you can also apply that to a family member or an international community. Now the forgiveness one, which I chose to put last, because it is the most difficult to me. And many people define forgiveness as, you know, taking the weight off of you, doing something for you, and not necessarily having to forgive the other person's actions or behavior. And I agree with that. And I also offer this. If we in our unity recognize that everyone matters, which to me means everyone even in their good, bad, and the ugly, are magnificent, are children of God, mm -hmm. deserve to be here, have that center post of unconditional love from the universe within each of us. And our behaviors are what they are, and some of them are abhorrent, like what Ugoji's uh, speaking about with the refugees and what they experienced. But when we can go there, then forgiveness to me is an inside personal job. It is the job that I have defined as this. In my judgment of you, I have allowed myself to see you outside of that unifying togetherness that we all matter. And so my journey of forgiveness is to allow myself to see you beyond your behavior in that space. And from that place, I don't have to carry anything. I don't have to have someone else change their behavior. I have complete control over whether I can allow you to be forgiven by me, which means I see you in your wholeness. And there equals forgiveness is really not necessary when you have no judgment, just love. Wow. That's very powerful. That's very powerful. And how do people um, engage with your program? Um, connect with it for that um, guidance and feedback. Oh, for the guidance and feedback, please co contact me and we can have a complimentary, open, listening conversation time at Sharon, S-H-A, capital R-O-N, at those four letters for no judgment, njjl.world. I'm willing, I'm mm -hmm. ready, and I'm open to have that conversation with anyone who connects with me. And for the 11 days, the program is on Facebook. The event was created. So go to uh, We Campaign for Unity, look on events, and you'll find it there. Excellent, excellent. And so you spoke about these listening sessions. I know you've been holding them for a while. Can you give us a little bit of information of what that's about and how people have experienced it? Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Catherine. I'm not aware if everyone has had the opportunity to look outside and see what the discourse is, at least in the United States and more often in all over the world. On, on a number of topics, uh, climate change, racism, government, education, so many of those things. And what I hear people saying is we have to have those uncomfortable conversations about these things that we disagree with or that we want to change. And from my personal place, I'm not sure I want to go into an uncomfortable conversation very willingly. <laughs> so I've created the comfy couch of no judgment, just love conversations. Now that right there to me opens up a willingness. Oh yeah, maybe I do wanna go sit on a comfy couch and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So Catherine, I've had the great experience of 
testing this with um, people who are in conflict with their own upbringing regarding racism. And that includes me. And it's difficult to have that very personable, personal, judgmental conversation with people who don't have a safe holding space for you to just let out what you need to let out. So in these comfy couch conversations, I do the very first thing that I believe is important. I listen. And I allow people to just share what's in their heart. And if they choose to converse or if they choose to ask me for conversation, I'm happy to engage. Nice. That's very nice. Um, so that's wonderful. I want to remind people that you are listening to Heart of Mind Radio for the New Millennium. And we are talking about We the World and organizations worldwide that are taking part in programs and calls to action in September in observance of and in alignment with 11 Days of Global Unity, September 11th to the 21st, and the UN International Day of Peace, which is September 21st. This emerging international movement consists of more than 3,500 civil society organizations in nearly every country that are presenting concerns, concerts, conferences, festivals, forums, marches, broadcasts, and other programs in September to address local and global social, political, economic, and environmental challenges to humanity and all of life on earth. So that's what this is really all about. And this is, uh, has been going on for quite a while since maybe 20, 2004. Um, so it's a wonderful series of events that you can become engaged with, that you can learn more about at we.net. And I just wanted to um, share the different campaigns, human rights, freedom, disarmament, peace, among others. So it's just so amazing to me that we have an opportunity to come together as a community of people who care, people who want to make a difference in our world to um, shepherd this vision forward at we.net. So I would really love to um, go back around and have um, a, another segment of the conversation with regard to um, how you feel about what you're doing, the, the vision that you're holding, the hopes that you might have, or maybe to go a little bit more into how people can connect with the work that you're doing and that you're sharing, not just with 11 Days, but with the other aspects of, of your work. Ugoji, would you like uh, to share? Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say that um, I'd like to feel that I'm making a, a difference in the world. I'm, uh, you know, I'm making a change in the world, more particularly in for women and children in, in war zones. And um, um, I can easily be contacted if you Google me or if you contact me by um, my full name at gmail.com. Um, it's good in this, in what I do to sort of learn and share ideas. I mean, listening to Sharon speak, there's more that unites us. There's, she's sort of the, the missing link in what I'm doing. And I particularly like the idea of that her couch where you sit there and basically express yourself. <laughs> you know, that to me is a, is, is a fantastic idea. I'd, I'd love to come and sit on that couch. You know. <laughs> come on! But, you know, <laughs> You know what you should do, Sharon? I, I, I'll give you a challenge. Yes. When the UN is, you should bring that couch and put it in the, the middle of the hall of the UN. That would be a very good idea. So different countries who traditionally do not speak, and I'm not going to go there, it'd be a good idea to have them to actually sit on that couch. I would love that idea, Ugoji. Um, maybe you two remember Get Smart. It was a 
funny television show in the 60s. And they oh, used to have the cone of silence. <laughs> it was this um, plexiglass clear cone that would come over to people and they could converse in quiet. So I would put the cone of silence over that comfy couch so no one is interrupted. I'll take that challenge. Could you imagine, what, could you imagine the conversation that would go on? Yes, you know. I can. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds I'm wonderful. Not going there. I'm not going there. I'm just saying to you, could you imagine the conversation that will go on? You know, so I believe it's a good idea. It's, it's good to thank you so much, Catherine, for inviting us here because it gives us an opportunity to share ideas and see what is giving an opportunity to see what um, Sharon is doing and also the possibility of, of, um, of partnering because when I was listening to what you were saying, Sharon, I was thinking to myself, you know, wow, if only we had you all those years ago mm. where we refugee children could actually be put on a couch after being given a cup of tea, you know, you're, you're in England, and actually being able to express how we feel, you know, how we felt. Because, no, you know, in those days, it was, you know, people, especially in the in the in the British context, you're not supposed to show your emotions. Right. You know, you're supposed to sort of keep a step up a lip and, and just basically get on with it. You know, it would have been nice if we had that couch and, you know, the proverbial couch and you're able to sit there and really, you know, really express how you feel. You know, really, so, you know, I, I don't... You know, I, I really don't want to go to school. I don't feel comfortable being at school. I mean, this if I was on that couch, these are the things that will come out, mm. you know. I don't like being at school and everybody pointing their finger at me because I'm a refugee. I don't like being at school and everybody, you know, other children are having beautiful clothes and I don't have beautiful clothes. I have clothes from the Red Cross. I don't like being, you know not being able to have toys. I always remember the first thing I, I wanted for Christmas when we got to London was actually a doll to play with. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. a doll, you know. So, you know, you know, I, I commend you for what you do, Sharon, because you're, as I say, you give um, everybody, not just on, on a, a local level, but also an international level, an opportunity to express themselves. You know, to really, as you say, not to judge each other, just to basically express themselves and, and to agree to disagree, but in, in a much more humane manner. You don't have to go to war because of that. Mm -hmm. If we could sit down and sort out our differences. And another thing that came to my mind when I was listening to you, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the world. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of is Islamophobia, you know, the hatred of Muslims. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we were to have like a little, a big couch and everybody sat down, the three different religions, and really, you know, came out and say, okay, what they feel threatened. Because really, you, you're threatened by somebody or a person you don't, who doesn't look like you, who doesn't believe yeah. the same as you do, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you know, so I, I take off my hat to, to you for your initiative, what you do. You know, it's, it's very good, you know. Thank you, Goji. Yeah, and it's, it's very good. Yes, that's beautiful. And uh, Sharon, do you have some visioning or dreams or something you want to share back um, oh, with yes. the people who are listening? Yes. Um, you know, I in my heart know now sincerely why I am here on this planet. I remember my grandfather when I was a little girl. Uh, I was an only child and I still am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he would say, that girl's different. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he didn't say it in a condescending way. It was more of a curiosity. What, do, why does, do I feel she's different mm -hmm. in a way that's going to be a good way? is what I felt from him. Mm -hmm. And so I spend a lot of time uh, uncovering how I move around the world. 
And what I've concluded is two words. I am here to cultivate love. And I want to be invited. I want to find myself in places where judgment exists. Wow. So well, for the opportunity to allow more love. Well, there's no shortage of those places in the world today. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to bring your couch. You should bring your couch into the UN. I will bring my couch. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I uh, will. That's wonderful. And, uh, I, you know, I have to say that I'm very, very inspired talking to both of you. Because I yeah. find that, you know, I get up every day, in a way, looking for um, my, my path for that day, my journey for that day. And mm -hmm. sometimes it becomes very difficult to say, okay, let me uh, move through this journey. Let me connect with this person. Let me do this work. Let me write this article. Let me do this interview. And there are times I have to admit that I just don't want to, to do any of those things. And mm -hmm. I have this idea that maybe I could find a way to close myself off from the world and not have to interact with anything. And I think we all go through that from time to time. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's also very inspiring that when we do something like this and we do get together and talk, there's this uh, interplay and inspiration where we can lift each other up and inspire each other by what we're trying to do in our own lives. So I'm very grateful to be able to have this conversation with the both of you and hopefully we can do it again. We don't have to wait till 11 days next year, you know. <laughs> we can get together. Right. <laughs> we can get together and have a nice conversation and, you know, depending on the environment, have calls and I just think that we need to um, remember what it is to be human, like you were saying, Sharon, but really be human for ourselves, be human with each other. And maybe um, on some days we just have to not be so hard on ourselves and, and take a break. And then next day, get back to the, to the grind and do the work that we want to do. So it's, it's, it does take a village and it does take a community. And I think that this um, organization and the work that we're doing at we.net is a fantastic place for people to get involved um, because there's so much going on. People can get involved in that or they can volunteer for the various projects. Mm -hmm. um, people can bring their own creative ideas to it and create something under this umbrella. So I think it's wonderful for people to engage and understand that they don't have to just sit at home and do nothing and become frustrated with the world. Because when we're doing something, when we're making changes, when we're endeavoring to make it better for everyone, then that is a way of also uplifting our own lives. So it works in both directions. So I'm really, really happy to have you both here. And um, before we run out of time, I wanted to give again the exact specifics of your events um, before we uh, finish, close for this particular conversation. So um, Ugoji, why don't you tell us about your, your two events coming up? Okay, on the 16th, I'll have the um, internally displaced children, um, the missing gap in the global humanitarian crisis. It will again be on the WE um, website on the, from 10.15 to 11.45. On the 18th, I'll have Voices of Refugees up close and personal, which will be a conversation a workshop um, on refugees. Um, that will be on the 18th from um, 11.30 till 1.30. So I do hope you will be able to join us on that day and hear from the voices of refugees up close and personal. Thank you. Excellent. And Sharon? Thank you. I am also uh, supported by We The World, and I will be on Facebook under the We Campaign for Unity. The event is already up. So I encourage people to search for that and click join. 
because once you join, you have the opportunity to participate in a global conversation about no judgment, just love. The activities will begin on September 11th, I'm sorry, September 17th, which is a Thursday. Once a day, I'll post a challenge and hopefully we'll engage in conversation. And it goes until for five days, ending on September 21st, the United Nations International Day of Peace. Excellent, excellent. And I am uh, one of the coordinators for the Health and Wellness Day, which is the 15th. And I know that we're going to be doing a broadcast on that day. And other events are coming together. So I'll ask people to take a look for that as well and see how we're all coming together. And the 11 days are unity, interdependence, environment, economic justice, health and wellness, children and youth, women, human rights, freedom, disarmament, and peace. So that is a full spectrum of uh, ways that we can make change in the world and, and just make it a better place because mm -hmm. the world needs it, we each need it, and our future generations need it as well. It's really, really important that we <clears throat> find our way as a human race. And I think that this work is one way to do that. It's, it's leading us in that direction in any case. So thank you both. Um, certainly we have a few more minutes if you have anything else you'd like to add. Um, Catherine, I just want to let you know, I was in a, a WE meeting on Monday and a new website has been created. And there exists all of the events in a, in a clean new way. So their new URL is we.we.net. And I just realized I went to we.net and the old website is there. So what I'm gonna do is uh, communicate with the developers to see if they can forward we.net to the new one. So no one has to worry what the URL is. Just wanted to share that little bit. Oh, excellent, excellent. And um, if you can, um... <clears throat> forward that to me, I'll, I'll put it on the announcement with the uh, program so people can connect to it. Absolutely Go, will. Go, do you want yes, to sorry. say something? I can say something. This is um, a separate event I'll be doing on, the on Sunday, the 27th of um, September, 2020, um, in line with uh, um, Pope Francis. And it's called the 106th World Day of Migrants and Refugees. Um, the theme this year is, I quote, like Jesus Christ forced to flee, welcoming, protecting, promoting, and integrating internally displaced persons. Again, the information will go up on, on my Facebook page and it will also go out. I'll be hosting a high level event on um, internally displaced um, persons, again, in line with the message of Pope Francis for the 106th World Day of Migrants and Refugees 2020. Thanks very much. Excellent. And if both of you could send me, just email me the links to your events for mm -hmm. okay. the WE campaign and otherwise. And yes. I'll just list it on the, um, on the page that, that introduces the program. That way people can make those connections if they choose okay. to. And um, they won't have to search too hard. They'll just find it right on the um, description page uh, or the archive page, because it will all be archived at prn.fm um, for um, the, the present and the future. So people can make those connections. And I, I want to just uh, quickly honor you, Catherine, because what Ugoji and I get to do is wonderful, but you amplifying our voices is necessary yes. to audiences that may or may not know we or know Ugoji or myself. We appreciate you wholeheartedly. Keep it up. Well, thank you very yes. much. Thank Absolutely. You very much. Thank you so much for giving us a voice and also for giving us a voice as women. You know, yeah, I know. I, I was paying attention to that. It felt really good. I didn't want yeah. to bring it up, but it was like, wow, this is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> the, bring it a up. Call up, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really but special. Also, there's a saying that women hold up half the sky. And yes. it's particularly important that women of color, that our voices are heard. 
absolutely you know, true. Also to educate people that there are women of color who are doing positive things to make a difference in the world, you know, who are game changers. I consider um, three of us as game changers. We're making absolutely. a difference. And, you know, thank you so much for giving us a voice and getting us out there. And You're thank you, well. Gerald. Thank you. And um, you've been listening to Heart of Mind Radio for the New Millennium. And I'm going to have to say TV as well, um, because we're moving into a new age. Um, my guests have been Ugoji Eze. Is it Eze or Eze? Eze. Eze. Ugoji yeah. Eze is an attorney, author, entrepreneur, and a skilled producer of events and programs at the United Nations in New York. And her work is very much dedicated to refugees and to children who are suffering through that whole process of being displaced. So definitely look for her work. Also, Sharon Rea, and she is really on that serious mission to make the world a better place. She is founder of the global movement, No Judgment, Just Love. And so hopefully we'll have this conversation again soon. And thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Okay. Thank I'll, you. You're welcome. Bye-bye for now. Bye. I was born by the river In a little tent Oh, just like the river I've been running Ever since It's been a long A long time coming But I I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I am afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I, I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. There's been time. Change gone.